Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward to visiting with you today. I think the best shows are ones where a lot of folks call in and we can talk about what you're interested in. So if you will, um, uh, let's see, hold on. First of all, I want to give you the phone number. It's 845-5689. And if you want to email me, it's gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu all right well thanks for i'll thank you in advance for the call i appreciate it we want to talk to some of you guys about all kinds of things from lawns to fall gardening to to fall planting and in fact i'm going to spend a little bit of time on fall planting here just to kick things off um i uh I, there are Let's see. The fall is the best time to plant. I keep saying that over and over again, but it is. And the reason, especially for woody ornamentals and perennials, uh, because they have time all through the cool season for roots to develop. And roots will develop in the cool soil. We don't have the, you know, two foot deep freeze around here in the winter. So uh, the winter is a good time for roots to continue to do some developing. And uh, it helps the plant settle in when you plant too, you know, soil kind of filters down as as water moves it into the open spaces that might have been left on planting. You get a little bit of that benefit. But mainly, next summer is the hardest thing those plants are going to face, the first brutal summer. And by planting now, your plants have the most time to be the most prepared. And when in the case of smaller things like perennials, uh, they, they just do better with a fall planting. In fact, I say that fall planting can even save you money and here here's here's what i mean by that when you purchase a plant you 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 pay for the dirt and and uh of course that's not literally true but you can take the same size plant in a four inch pot or a six inch pot or a gallon pot and the price goes up significantly with each of those moves even though the plant size isn't much larger in many cases but even if it is larger if you put a four inch a healthy a well-rooted four-inch plant of a perennial in now, and then you waited and you put a gallon plant in next March, for example, or April, uh, by the time you get into summer, it's going to be hard to see the difference between those plants in most cases. And so you can save money by choosing a smaller size and putting it in the fall. And for some people, they, they would rather have more of the instant results and go with the larger plant. That's fine, too. But I, you know, everybody has... Um, I don't know, axes to grind and and uh, things that uh, just really annoy them. Uh, well, for me, in fall planting, I have one. And the most frustrating part about it is I can't change it, and I don't think it's going to change. Aren't you curious what I'm about to say? Plants, by and large, woody ornamentals are grown in round pots. And when a root grows in a round pot and hits the side, it typically will turn left to right and it'll go around the pot and start circling that pot. Uh, when that plant is moved to a larger pot, uh, in the process of let's say you're going to buy a 20 gallon tree, well, it, they didn't take a, a, like an acorn and plant it in the middle of a 20 gallon pot. It, it, it grew through stages. And when it's moved up, you've got this ring of roots that's not very large, especially if it was started in something about gallon size. Uh, that is kind of like a, a ongoing problem, going to be an ongoing problem for that plant. Uh, by the time it goes in the ground, some of those inner circles are hidden by the fact that it was repotted and the, and the uh, interior circle of roots you can't see. And we always say that you need to cut the roots on the outside of the pot when you take things out because almost everybody is buying plants in a round pot. And uh, by cutting those roots, they will branch. And just like if you went up to a shoot on a tree and took your pruners and snipped it off, you would have several buds that break out 
from just behind that point, and they would take off growing. And roots do too. I did an experiment one time in a garden center. They allowed me to access some of their trees, and we pulled a few up, and we cut the roots, sliced big, long, vertical slices down through the side of the root ball in about uh, three or four places, and cut all the roots going around, and then put them back in the pot, and came back a few weeks later, and when we pulled them up, we could see fresh, new, white root growth coming from those cuts. So all of those new roots, more roots than the one we cut, uh, are going to grow out and much better establish that plant in the ground. So cutting roots is important. Uh, my frustration is the fact that we have better pots than round pots that we could grow things in. Uh, there's a fellow up in Oklahoma State University, uh, um, uh, Dr. Wickham, and uh, he developed a pot that is a uh, square. In fact, he has several versions of, of it, but he what he did is the roots hit a side. They hit a corner or there's a little like a fin sticking out from the pot. They hit it and they go down and they encounter an open hole. There are several holes in the side, and when they do, the air prunes that root. It, it doesn't grow, it, it, it burns off, we say, but it's basically air pruned. And so that root system branches and more grow. And when you pull one of those plants out of the pot, you have a very nice, well-developed root system. And a plant that when you put it in the ground, the roots are just gonna keep taking off in all directions. Oftentimes, with a root circling problem of a, of a tree or a shrub, especially trees, because they get much, much larger than shrubs, uh, that root gets bigger and bigger, and the trunk gets bigger and bigger, and one day you look up and it's like the tree needs to be watered, or it's not growing, or the leaves don't look good, and on so on. And when you finally find the problem, it is like an anaconda has wrapped around that tree trunk and is deeply embedded in it and essentially choking it. And there's just not much of a way to fix it well at that point. Uh, by the time you see physical evidence on the tree, it's it's getting a little late to help in many cases. And so it, it would be so simple to put roots or put, put these plants in a more um, appropriate pot. So why don't why doesn't the industry do that? Well, here's why. Nobody asks for it and nobody's willing to pay for it, maybe. Uh, it's going to cost more to grow a plant in a pot like that. Now, when you think about a tree that you hope is there 100 years from now, uh, that's worth paying uh, a couple of dollars more on that tree uh, for the cost of the pot, and it's well worth doing. But um, if a grower grow the, grows those, unless he does a really good job educating his resale customers, and the resale customers do a very good job educating the public, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. And so... The, it's just a problem that's going to keep going on and on, but uh, I can't tell you how many times I've encountered a tree that had a, a root strangling it. Now, that's typically a root that maybe went around a gallon pot size. You know, a root that's going around a 15-gallon pot is never going to get large enough and most likely to really strangle that trunk, uh, but it still needs to be cut. They establish faster. They establish better. Uh, and another thing, other interesting thing happens. Uh, if you've ever been to a playground and seen those little animal-like creatures that kids sit on and they're like uh, attached to a car spring so the kids can lean forward and sideways and backwards, you know, there, there's no significant support, uh, you know, for the, the child sitting on there. I mean, they, it moves. And when you have a circling root like that, and instead of having roots going out in all directions that are holding the soil, holding onto the soil, and and they stabilize the, that trunk of the tree, you have a tree that when you grab it, it's like it's hinged at the bottom, just below where it goes into the ground, and that's not a good uh, situation. You can stake it, but it's going to take a long time before that tree is going to be really well established. And again, it all could have been prevented. So anyway, that, that's my gripe for today, and I'll, I'll not gripe anymore. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you do plant shrubs and trees, just please, please take and cut those roots and know that you're doing a good thing. In fact, a lot of our, our forestry folks uh, would even recommend doing root washing. You pull it out of the pot, and you essentially wash all of that growing mix off the root system. You go in there with your hand pruners and you do all the trimming that needs to get done and then you plant the tree and get soil, you know, 
sprinkle soil in to kind of go around those roots and press it in and that tree actually will be better off. Root washing is a mess and it takes time and I don't expect many people to agree to do it but anyway that's what it is. Well give us a call. Our phone number is 845-5689 845-5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu gardensuccess at tamu Dot edu. And let's go to the email. Uh, I had an interesting email from John, uh, and uh, it, it sort of took me back uh, to another time, I guess. Uh, John asks about the conical divots in, in sand. Uh, you walk around, and looking down, you see a, a cone-shaped hole in the soil. comes right to a point, and it's a perfect little round hole cone shaped and I bet some of you know what that is already. Uh, I grew up uh, playing with with the creature that does that. That the creature is called a doodle bug by kids or an ant lion by an entomologist and uh, I don't even know the scientific name of it, but it's a it's a a dirt kind of a tan dirt colored creature with giant mandibles. Uh, I like its mouth parts in the front are like the giant ice hooks that they would put on a block of ice to pick up that block of ice. So, you know, take your two arms, bend, the, bend them, and then bring your hands together, and that's sort of how those work. And ant lions create these little divots by kicking soil up out of the mound. And, of course, as the soil goes out, and it, some of it slides back down, they kick it out again, and they end up just creating that little cone and the an ant comes walking along and when it hits the edge of that cone it just slides right down in there and as it tries to climb out the sand just kind of crumbles away and falls back toward the bottom of the hole and the ant lion comes out and eats the ant and that's how that works and I, I say ant lion I suspect there are other insects that they eat I, I haven't really studied them but when we were a kid we'd take a little stick and here we go we take a little stick and we put it in that hole and uh, turn it in a circle just keep going around make a very small circle and you have to this is a very important this is the most important part you have to say doodle bug doodle bug your house is on fire doodle bug doodle bug your house is on fire and the little insect comes up and if you don't grab them quick they go down back fast but you can grab one put them on your hand look at them play with them see what they look like uh, but anyway that John, thank you for the question because that brought back old memories. In fact, if you guys said something else, uh, I'd love to hear a call if anybody did that when they were a kid. That would be very interesting uh, to hear. Uh, John also asks uh, about uh, some beetles in a pine tree trunk. He sees holes in the trunk and questions about what to do about that. Um, so when a beetle burrows into a living pine, sap is the tree bleeds sap out in an effort to push out the invader. Uh, not, a, not a successful effort, but it, it does that. And you end up with a little ball of sap or a little glob of sap with a hole in the middle. And if uh, it, that's caused by one of several pine beetles, there, there are at least five pine beetles I know of in Texas. Uh, there may be more, but again, I'm not the entomolog pine entomologist there. But um, there's there's one that attacks low on the tree, and that's a turpentine beetle. And for most practical, you know, go walk up to the tree and reach up about as high as your hand reaches, and the turpentine beetle is going to attack from there down to the ground. Uh, then there are several beetles as you go up the trunk. There's a couple or more of Ips engraver beetles. There's the southern pine beetle that's the one that's most famous for destroying large areas of a forest. Uh, and, and anyway, some others. But uh, the Ip, uh, excuse me, the turpentine beetle by and large is not a huge problem for the tree. They don't occur in the mass numbers and just essentially cut the tree's supply off from its roots. But things like the pine bark beetle and Ips engraver and others can do that and uh, with a home pine tree we just don't have the equipment and the ability to effectively spray the trunk and by the time you see it 
uh, that with the more uh, the ones that attack in mass and they kill the tree quickly. By the time you see it, it it's too late to save that tree. But you would spray your other trees at putting a protective coating for the beetle. Again, we don't have the the products that work very very well. We don't have the equipment to spray so that it does an effective job of preventing them, and it tends to just be something that we end up having to live with. Sometimes you see a beetle that goes in and just kicks back sawdust out of the hole. Uh, that, that's probably a different kind as well. So, John, you might want to have a certified arborist come and take a look at the tree, determine which beetle you're dealing with, and they might have some suggestions or may be able to come out and do a treatment for you if that is warranted. I had another uh, question for John, wanting to uh, plant some something in a kind of a shady terrace area uh, and thinking about wandering Jew as a plant. Uh, there are several types of plants uh, that are related that have a vine-like growth, and some of them we call wandering Jew. Uh, there are some that have a kind of a pinkish splotching on the leaves. There are some that have green and white striped leaves uh, and um, just different variations. There's also another plant that we call purple heart and it is all purple especially in the sun. As you put it in more and more shade it loses the purple color uh, and those all can be established pretty easily. Uh, I guess you could almost think of them as weeds uh, because they as they run along the ground their stem forms roots at the nodes where they can root into the ground. So getting it started is very easy. If you can find some, somebody let you have some, which they probably will if they've got that stuff. Uh, you could take cuttings, put them in a little pot to start your own plant, or probably just go out and put them in the ground and keep it watered, and they would start to grow. But just realize that is a spreading plant. Now, Purple Heart spreads very slowly, uh, but it is a spreading plant. And once you get it established, it's hard to get rid of. Uh, so that may you may want to rethink some of your options uh, for that shady area. Uh, John had also asked about using a product uh, with bifenthrin for the pine bark beetle, and I wanted to comment a little bit on some of the pesticides uh, that we use out there, like bifenthrin. Bifenthrin is one that sticks around a good while. It's often used by the folks that come around and treat your home to keep the bugs out. Uh, and uh, these uh, private applicators will use different products, several different products, but one of them is bifenthrin, and uh, it sticks around pretty good. When you're standing at the bottom of a tree trying to spray the trunk, uh, there's a mist that's going to be falling down on you and getting in your face and eyes and things, and that concerns me. It's not like you're going to, you know, it's just going to be terminal right in that day, but it's it just not a good way to, to expose yourself, and not a good idea to expose yourself to those kind of pesticides. Their, their toxicity is, uh, it varies between the different synthetic pyrethroids. All the, I call them the thrins, all the thrins, bifenthrin, cyfluthrin, you get the idea. Uh, and some of them are more toxic than others, a little bit more persistent than others. They're all based off uh, imitating a molecule that is a natural uh, insecticide pyrethrin, uh, pyrethrum or pyrethrin, the ingredient in it. And so I would talk to a professional and have them come out and consider the treatment if it would be necessary. Well, that was a lot about pine beetles, but uh, occasionally we get some questions on those. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And I just got news today that Garden Success is now going to be available by podcast. So you can listen to us live on your radio if you're within the region or the area. Uh, if you are somewhere else, you can listen live on your computer by going to the KAMU website. And the past shows are also there on the website if you want to go back and listen to something else. Uh, but now, whether you have Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, iHeart, or NPR, uh, you can look for Garden Success with Skip Richter, and it's going to be available by podcast. Uh, so uh, there's a few of the back shows that we, you could find on the website that are going to be loaded up as well. And today's show will make it there. So I guess I need to watch what I say now. Uh, I, I 
I'm, I'm always conscious of the fact that we do have a few people that listen from outside. So there may be some comment that's very applicable in the Brazos Valley, but maybe not in Dallas or Houston, or we have folks that listen from um, New Braunfels and different places. Uh, and so now I have to really kind of think about that. Uh, let's see, we had an email come in from Taryn, uh, and it is about a Chinese pistache. Uh, they planted a Chinese pistache, and f for a period of time when they were away, it got really hot and dry, and the plant suffered uh, from that. And the, the question, and oh, also a little added information, uh, it was, they ended up, uh, whoever planted it ended up putting it a little bit deep, too deep, and that is not a good thing. When you plant a woody ornamental, especially a tree, you want the topmost root to be at the soil level. So what you would do is, you know, take it out of the container and because it's been bumped up to larger size containers, sometimes they just keep adding soil on top and what's the soil level in the container is not the level that tree should be planted at. So you scrape away the material on top all the way down the trunk until you hit a root and that is what should be at, at the soil line and you measure from that to the bottom of the cylinder. That's how deep the hole should be. We don't want to dig a deeper hole and then throw loose soil in to bring the level of the bottom of the hole up because that will just settle down and the plant will be too too deep. And it's a it's a fairly significant concern when you plant trees too deep. So that's how you find the level uh, that you want to plant it. The question is, and this is a hard question for me, um, do, do we dig that thing up and do we reset it at the right level? I had another question this week at the extension office the same way, and but this was one that had only been in the ground a couple of weeks. And I said, absolutely, pull it up and get it planted right at the right level as soon as you can, because I know that that kind of plant has not already established a big root system around that original root ball. Uh, but this one that's been in probably a year now, I'm, I'm guessing from the, the write-up, uh, that's a little bit tougher call. I, I guess I'd almost want to see the situation, uh, how too deep is it? Uh, that would be a factor. Uh, is it a situation where you can pull some soil away and kind of remedy it? I know they indicate it's a heavy clay soil, it's a low area, so those, those are both not good ideas. But uh, this is one I would just have to be on site and look at. And add to that the fact that this tree was really stressed, lost a lot of leaves, and seems to be struggling along. That would be another reason not to want to uh, mess with it too much. Uh, it, it may be in trouble either way, but um, I would at least wait until all the leaves are off to do any digging up and redoing the area and replanting. That's a tough call. And there may be some foresters listening that disagree with what I said. So feel free to call in. I'm always, always willing to hear. Um, I want to talk a little bit about vegetables today. We are in the best gardening season of the year, the fall. Uh, spring is wonderful. Everybody gets spring fever. There's all kinds of things we plant in the spring, like our cherished tomatoes. Uh, but fall is just the best season of the year. If you have some uh, green beans that you planted, let's say, in late August for a fall crop, uh, they're coming into harvest now, and they are the sweetest, the best quality ripening in cooler weather compared to one that maybe you plant in mid to late spring and it's ripening in very hot weather, ripening meaning uh, reaching the uh, mature enough stage where you would want to pick it. Um, and so fall is, is better for a lot of the warm season crop uh, in their um, actual harvest time. And then the cool season crops are all going in now. They've been going in since September. All of the blue leaf vegetables like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kohlrabi, kale, uh, collards, uh, those are all going in now. Uh, the seeded um, root crops, radishes and, and beets, uh, carrots uh, can be planted at this time and they are scattered out and planted very shallowly. In fact, with carrots and lettuce, you just want to sprinkle the seed on top of the soil and wet the soil and press them in a little bit. They don't need to be buried. Some light helps them with germination. Uh, and so those can all be planted at this time. Uh, the cool season peas like uh, sugar snap pea 
Um, you could try them now and, and really hope that the first hard freeze is delayed, but it's getting a little bit late to have success with those. We have to kind of get them in in September and try to keep them a little shaded and cool and then to get them to actually produce the crop before it, it freezes and gets too cold. Uh, but anyway, there there are other crops that we can put in this time of year. If you haven't tried growing Asian vegetables, and there are so many of those, uh, I would encourage you to give them a try this year. Maybe start with something like uh, bok choy. Uh, some uh, uh, areas call it pak choy, uh, but that is a fast grower. Some of them about 28 days, and uh, they're easy. Uh, they do uh, suffer from beetle attacks, so you might want to throw a little netting or row cover over the the row and let them grow up underneath that and just kind of protect them against that. I, uh, uh, there's a number of them. Tot soy, is tot soy is pretty good to grow. It's a very flat, dark green uh, growth habit, uh, a little bit stronger. Most of those are in the, the mustard family. And uh, if you've eaten mustard, you know about it has a strong pungency. And uh, so as we look at all the different members of the family, a lot of them are very mild compared to that and hardly any at all, but they, they, you still pick up just a little bit of that. And so that it may be a taste that, uh, that is somewhat acquired for you. I like almost all of them. Uh, when we get all the way to mustard, believe it or not, shame to say this, but I'm just not a big fan. It's a little strong for me. But anyway, Asian vegetables, so many good ones. Uh, we could just really do a whole show just talking about Asian vegetables. Uh, so anyway, the vegetable garden, uh, if you've got some weeds that are starting up, all our cool season weeds are, are starting to sprout now. Um, that would be things like henbit and chickweed. Excuse me, I said starting to sprout. They've actually been sprouting for a little while. Uh, henbit and chickweed and carpetweed, annual bluegrass, uh, clovers, those sorts of things. Uh, and if they're in your garden and flower bed, just do a little light, shallow uh, sweep of a hoe through there and take them out when they're young, or just throw some mulch on top of them. If you can bury them under a mulch where the light can't get to them, those young weeds will just die and you don't have to pull them. Now, there are a few weeds that can push through mulch, but in general, the majority of them are that way. Uh, so I, that uh, just some tips, I guess, for the for the cool season garden. All these blue leaf vegetables and some of the ones we talked about do best if you put them under some sort of a cover, uh, a netting or a, a spun bound polyester row cover. These are available at garden centers and online. Uh, and you just they're so lightweight, you know, half ounce per square yard. Uh, the plant just grows right up underneath them, and it's like a screen porch. And so if you don't want to spray, and with a lot of these vegetables, you know, we're eating all the leaves on the vegetable. And so to coat all those leaves with any pesticide, well, I'd rather not do that. And with the row cover, you block out the pest. You just have to lift it up during harvest, but um, it, it's easy to do. Now, if, they are, if they're already on your plants and you throw a row cover over them, uh, you just lock the criminals in the jewelry store, and that's not a that's not going to end well. So you want to make sure and do it before the pests arrive and start to bug your uh, tender uh, succulent vegetables. Uh, our lawns. Uh, one thing I'm noticing, driving around town and looking at lawns, uh, there, there's a of course a wide range. Some folks were watering quite a bit, and the lawn just looks like it never. Um, was set back. Uh, folks that uh, watered moderately on, only as needed to keep the lawn alive, like mine, is uh, the lawn looks okay. It, it needs, you know, to kick back in next growing season and recover a little bit, but it looks pretty good. Uh, and then there's lawns that were not watered uh, for various reasons, and uh, they weren't watered much. And they're looking pretty thin and, and not great. I've had a lot of calls on my lawn's dying. What do I do? Uh, and you may see a dead area, and there's a sprig of grass here, or a clump of grass there. Uh, and it's, it's a tough call at this time as to, as to, how, to how to deal with that now. Uh, when you have bare areas like that, the sunlight is going to hit the soil, and weed problems are going to come in. And so you have a couple of options. One would be to spray them uh, and, and kill them, and that has its pros and cons for the grass. Uh, and the other option would be to just let them grow and mow them 
and uh, start gradually working your way out of the weed problems by mowing regularly, watering and fertilizing properly, uh, and building the density of the lawn over time. Now, everybody's going to have a different tolerance for weeds. Uh, I personally, unless it's a very unusual weed that stands out like a neon sign, it's not going to bother me. I'm just going to mow it and keep going because I know I can, I can basically get the grass to choke it out for me. And again, there are exceptions. And I'll talk about some of those in just a minute. Uh, but now is, is a good time if you haven't seen weeds germinating to get a pre-emergent herbicide down and water it in. Most areas, those weeds are already going to be germinating, and so it's too late for a pre-emergent, and you would need to switch to a post-emergent uh, type product. With the weather as cool as it is, once we get temperatures and they're mid-80s uh, mid and below, these broadleaf products work very well on the weeds, and they're not as hard on St. Augustine. When it's 95 degrees, they're very hard on, on many of them are very hard on St. Augustine. And so we try to avoid uh, using them. Now we have a few weeds that are able to survive in the lawn, even a dense lawn. Uh, and one of those uh, is our fall aster. A fall aster is a blue-green weed that spreads horizontally in a mowed turf area. And if you let for fall aster grow in a vacant lot, you're going to have stuff knee-high and higher growing in there. I mean, it, it gets big. But it, it has an ability when we mow it to go horizontal, go sideways. And it comes out of one spot in the ground, so think of it as a single tap root. And it's not hard to pull if the soil is moist. Uh, you may have a weed that's, you know, a foot across or more. Uh, but if you find the center of it, you're just pulling one, root, one central root out of the ground. Uh, and uh, you want to do it in, in well-watered soil so the soil is a little soft. Uh, I've kind of developed, and you will too, a technique as you pull them to avoid them breaking off. Uh, you kind of shake it b back and forth as you pull it up. Uh, some people do a little twist and other things, but uh, it's good to get those out because they are just about to start blooming. And when they bloom, they have a little dime size uh, white with kind of a pink, maybe a lavenderish tint, uh, daisy like blossoms, dime size. And each of those puts out a lot of seed. Uh, last year, I took one of them and basically, uh, after it had gone to seed, and took it apart and I uh, counted 50 seeds inside that one blossom. So if you think about these things having 100 blossoms on, on a, a good-sized plant, uh, that's a lot of seed. And those are going to go out in the ground, and they're going to give you something to do when it's time to pull them next year. So what we like to do is get all of those out before they go to seed. And that goes true for all the weeds. Uh, now, if you've got a giant area, hand pulling an acre, for example, is, is just not practical. And we have to switch to certain kinds of herbicides for it. But if you've just got maybe a, a side or a corner of your yard, as I do, where they've moved in from a neighbor's yard, uh, I just kind of go out there and, and take care of them that way. No need to mix up a big tank or something to spray on them. Another weed that's very persistent is Virginia buttonweed. This one also grows horizontally in a little vine, and uh, it, it can be an issue. And uh, I think we talked about it a little last week. I talked with Todd. Uh, and he has has located a product uh, that are uh, found through an extension source, a product that uh, is a pretty effective against Virginia buttonweed. That's a hard weed to kill too, by the way, by herbicides. Uh, and typically, you're not going to find the better lawn control lawn weed control products just on the retail shelf. Uh, the commercial uh, applicators. Uh, who care for lawns and have that uh, ability to buy other products can get things that are a lot more effective. Uh, but what you'll find is those products are either packaged in very large quantities, you know, like a two-gallon jug, or, or if they're maybe a pint size, it'll cost you $150, $300 or something for some of them. Well, that's, you know, for a homeowner, that most of the time people just aren't going to pay that, and you need so little of it that uh, it, it's kind of hard to justify. So the best thing that you can do, I guess the moral to the whole lawn weed story is always be making your lawn denser by proper mowing, watering, and fertilizing. And the more you can do that, uh, the better off you are. And when nature throws us a 
45 degrees of 100, uh, uh, 45 days of 100 degree temperature and zero rain or, or less than a tenth of an inch of rain, that's just a tough time and we just kind of have to recover and deal with it. So maybe maybe that would be a good time to go, go and uh, uh, you know to get some counseling on uh, tolerating weeds better. I <laughs> it works for me. They're green. I mow them. They're they're fine. Uh, so anyway, uh, our phone number is eight four five five six eight nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine, or you can reach us by email garden success at t a m u dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu i uh, had an email come in from susan uh, let's see the agronomy society on campus texas a agronomy society uh, is doing a fundraiser and the students uh, worked hard on a corn patch to turn it in to a corn maze where the kids can kind of go in and and walk through and and uh, find their way out again and stuff. And they've grown maroon cotton and sunflowers as well and many other fall photo props. Uh, so you, you know how we always take our kids out and set them in the blue bonnets? Well, you got some other good photo props here that's put on by the Texas A&M agronomy students, the corn maze. Now, let's see if we got some details here. Okay, it opens up. Uh, it'll be open on October 21. 22 and 23, 21, 22, 23, also on the 28th, the 30th, and the 31st. Uh, and the, we'll, they'll be releasing the times as we get a little closer to the date. And Susan, if you'll keep me posted, I'll even announce those here too. Uh, so uh, it's out 2748 F&B Road in College Station. It runs runs behind the vet school, I believe. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that notification. Uh, Bob emails and, and asks, when do black walnuts drop from the tree? Are there any black walnut trees in the Bryan College Station area on public access land? Well, Bob, I suspect you're from a part of the country originally maybe that uh, where black walnuts grew well. Uh, there is a, that is the most aromatic uh, nut that uh, I've tasted as, as far as something growing in the United States. Uh, very unique. Uh, now, I refer to black walnuts, by the way, as diet nuts because, I mean, if they had 500 calories in one, which they don't, it takes about 600 calories to get that nut out of the shell. It's <laughs> like a Swiss cheese maze of wood that the nut is, is located in in there. And I don't know of any black walnut uh, populations here. I, I suspect there's probably a few around. The black walnut does reach down into Texas in its native range. You see it a little bit more uh, kind of a, a north and, and especially uh, especially north, but also a little east of us. Uh, but I don't know of any in this area, so that's a good question. Maybe one of the listeners does. Um, most of the time, if somebody's got a black walnut tree, they generally don't mess with the nuts because unlike our lovely pecan, the state tree, the shucks don't pop back, dry up, and drop the nut where you just go around picking the pecans off the ground. With black walnuts, you get this um, baseball-sized thing that falls on the ground, and it doesn't naturally just pop open like a pecan, and so you, you end up having to People devise all kinds of crazy things, including laying them on sandy soil and running over them with a car to smash that outside off. And then you get all the tannins on your hand and you go around with your hands uh, dark brown uh, for a while from working on them. But that, that's a story for another day, I guess. Uh, black walnuts, I, I enjoy them. There are actually some improved varieties um, that uh, you'll find as you go further north. And the improved basically meaning uh, it's not so hard to get the nut meat out of the nut uh, because it, it's not that wooden Swiss cheese thing that a regular native one would have. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about blooms also for this season of the year. I talked about the fall aster as a lawn weed. We have a another kind of fall aster uh, in fact, the, the lawn one is typically by the turf folks called Blackland Aster. Uh, it's got a, a couple of other names like that. But our fall aster that's in our gardens is a native uh, to some parts of the state. And during the year, it grows just as a, well, 
average looking shrub, uh, nothing to really write home about, no unique features. But then in the fall, it loads up with um, purplish lavender, purplish blooms. And they are beautiful and they last a long time. And you can trim your plants during the year to make them stay down low, uh, to pinch them, make them a little more dense, or you can trim them into a shrub form if you wanted. And it's really nice. Uh, and it, they're starting to bloom now. The um, um, Mexican mint marigold uh, has a licorice, black licorice jelly bean uh, smell to the foliage. It's used as a substitute for tarragon in, in cooking. And it has yellow blooms that come up at this time of the year. And then there are, is the Copper Canyon daisy. Copper Canyon daisy uh, has a very strong aroma to the foliage. And it sort of flops and spreads all over the place. It's a very... Um, it's not a tidy grower, uh, but it is well worth growing. The foliage smells to me like a cross between citrus and pine, but a very sharp smell, if we can refer to a smell as sharp. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, strong enough where a lot of people don't like it and uh, other people do, so uh, that would be another thing if you rub up against it. Uh, you would you would smell that. Uh, like the Copper Canyon Daisy. Our, our, um, we have some salvia. We have a salvia that blooms very well in the fall, uh, and it's uh, Mexican bush sage, salvia leucantha. It has purple bloom spikes with white blooms coming out of the purple calyx, uh, and it's very, very beautiful. It's a cool season. And we have a few other uh, fall blooming plants. And so maybe I'll talk about a little bit of those in a minute. Uh, right now I'm going to go to the phones. And again, the number, if you'd like to call, 845-5689. And we're going to talk to Dwayne. Hello, Dwayne. Uh, yes, uh, Sagid. Uh, How? Sagid. Um, um, I have a question about the top soil. Okay. Um, like I, I like to go around the town Try try to some um, top soil, but uh, top soil they are all sand, so it's not a soil. Okay. Wondering whether this kind of soil plants can grow. Yeah. Um, because they 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 so there's not a, so any clay. It the the, the, the wall going through it very quickly. Okay, you you were cutting out on me a little bit there, but I think I got the gist of it. Um, a lot of things. When it, when it comes to selling composts and soils and things, you can kind of call something what you want. Uh, it's, there's not a real clear uh, definition that someone said, you know, that's not truth in advertising. You That's not what, what you should call it. But a lot of things get called topsoil that are a scoop off the top of the soil, but it includes a lot of, of soil that's not topsoil in it. And uh, if it's from a sandy area, it may be sandy. Uh, it could be a clay type of soil. Uh, it's hard to find really good, dense quality topsoil. Uh, you, you, depending on what you want to grow, uh, amending the soil with some type of a compost uh, may be your best bet. Amending the soil you have. W Dwayne, what are what kind of plants do you want to grow in this soil? I so I just uh, wanted the sort of grass to, to grow there. So oh. I have a Okay. So yeah. My dry weight, so which is six higher than the just some soil. Okay. The grass will grow there. Okay. Well, the grass will grow in a in a clay soil, uh, and and I know our clays yeah. are, are very challenging to grow things in, but the the turf that you purchase that comes in on eighteen wheeler trucks uh, has a little thin layer of clay soil because the grass farms down toward the coast uh, are, are often that, that black clay soil. So it, it will do fine in just the clay. Uh, of course, loosening it up a little bit before you plant makes the grass do a little bit better. Uh, but often we already have tree roots through the yard, and so you can't just rototill the yard or something to loosen it up. Uh do you do you know anywhere in the town that we can buy really top soil? Yeah, I, to, to, to I, yard? I I don't have a, a just a source. You would just need to kind of go around and and I think you already have, but go around and look and see what they have. Uh, we have a few uh, soil yards around here, 
Uh, and I, I would just say, just keep searching and on some other ones. I, I just don't have a, a company to recommend for that. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dwayne. I appreciate the call. Sorry, we couldn't be more help on that one. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh let's see i want to go through here and look at some okay i was talking about fall blooming flowers and i named a few that we could plant uh, i want to name a, a couple of others i mentioned salvia lucantha mexican bush sage uh, there's also salvia regla which is called mountain sage and Whereas Mexican bush sage uh, has many sprouts coming out of the ground that form the plant, and typically it dies back or you prune it back to the ground again the next year, a salvia regla or mountain sage is more like a small subshrub. Uh, you, you know, you'll find them three or four feet high sometimes, and, and they have beautiful red blossoms that are very attractive to hummingbirds. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a fairly common one to find here in, in the area. Uh, it also is being a salvia is just well adapted uh, as most salvias are not all but most to our area and it does give us that that fall color it doesn't bloom during the regular part of the year just in the fall when we get into the late season uh, and so when we start to plant these kind of fall blooming plants and include them in the landscape and scatter them around your landscape becomes like a 12 month out of the year a beautiful place uh, you've got cool season flowers you can plant uh, even in the in the winter time, uh, but all through the season we keep the blooms coming, which supports bees and and pollinators in many cases, uh, and just makes for a, a beautiful landscape. Uh, let's uh, take a break for that for a minute and go to the phones and talk with John. Hello, John. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. I sent you an email with some pictures, and uh, yes also threatened you that I would call. Okay. Uh, what, pray tell, are those holes in the ground? Oh, John, I answered your question earlier in the show. <laughs> so oh. I'll give you the fast answer. Those are, are antlion holes, and they create those by kicking up the sand so that ants and other small insects walking along fall into it. So they, they're waiting, the antlion's sitting at the bottom just under the surface, uh, and it'll grab them and eat them. Huh. All right. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we we talked about uh, a little bit about the the uh, beetles in the pine and the and the uh, wandering Jew and things like that. And we, we do post these shows uh, to the web, so you can go back and uh, listen to all kinds of back uh, past shows as well. Did you have some additional okay. questions? Oh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering. Uh, the, the, the best spray for the the... I don't know which beetle it is. The, the, I think it's a small pine bark beetle. What's the best spray? Uh, I've got to get some. Uh, that one, uh, what my recommendation is to, to get a professional to come out and, and assess which beetle you have and assess whether a treatment is, is warranted or, w or would even be helpful. And then they can have access to products that are going to be more persistent and more effective if they choose to recommend a spray. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm losing trees of those. Oh well. Nervous. Yeah, I would send. Well, send me some pictures. Uh, you can you can email email me at the extension office. I'm there during the week, all week, and I'll be glad to take a look. But let me see the holes up close. Uh, if there's any sawdust or any globs of sap, uh, put something in the photo for um, to show size, like a pencil or your finger or something. Uh, and okay. and then let me see the overall trees, and and I'll I'll try and. Uh, an assessment, but really a, a certified arborist coming to the site is probably your best bet. It's hard to find a certified arborist. Uh, uh, I tried it yeah. two years ago, and the person who came on I was not very impressed with, uh, and he just looked at it and made a comment, well, it might be this, and that was all, Okay. and, and left. Now, now that, that was a certified, certified arborist? Sir? And that was yeah. a certified. Well, yeah. that's very well, unusual. Very we unusual. We paid a certified. Guy. It was a paid right. guy who was certified. Well, the only thing I can recommend to you is to go 
to treesaregood.org, treesaregood.org, uh -huh. and there you can find certified arborists within a given mileage range from where you live. Uh, and yes, they, they are sometimes hard to get because they stay very busy. They work on a lot of big projects. Uh, and sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, getting into an individual tree in somebody's yard is, is just a little bit small potatoes when they look at the their full plate of all the other things going on. But but mm -hmm. uh, they have their off seasons, and and I would I would persist in in trying to find one of those. Very good. All well, right. thank you very very much. Thank you, John. I appreciate the call. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Well, we got time for another call. Uh, our phone number is eight four five five six eight nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine or by email, garden success at t a m u dot edu garden success at t a m u dot edu uh, we're talking about fall blooming plants if you are a native enthusiast native plants enthusiast uh, there is a very upright sunflower a straight stalk with with don't think of the big sunflower that produces our edible sunflower seed but think of something oh i don't know maybe the size of a baseball in diameter uh, all up and down the stalk and uh, it's called Maximilian sunflower. It's typically found in wet areas like a ditch uh, where there's more dependable water. It doesn't need standing water. It just, you know, in a ditch along the roadside, it tends to have more access to a dependable supply. Uh, and it, it does spread underground. So, you know, it's a, it's a wild plant, uh, but uh, it, it is blooming at, at the fall season as well. And it's kind of a nice one for folks that are looking for uh, something that's more of a native plant. And we have other fall bloomers. And I would encourage you to consider those. Uh, I know that there are going to be folks out there that are suffering uh, from allergies. Um, and I, I know that, um, uh, that when, when you suffer from an allergy, as I do, uh, it, it can be a real challenge. And uh, there, of course, there's allergists and allergy testing and things like that uh, that can be very helpful. But I ran into a site the other day. I actually was, was uh, teaching a class for our master gardeners, and we went outside and and I was talking about how to how to prune a tree, and and uh, we were standing beneath some trees uh, that were a Chinese elm, and uh, which is a good tree for the area. And uh, I was pointing out limbs and stuff. And when we came back in, I, I my nose was running, my eyes were running, I was sneezing, and I had no idea what it was. And I went to a website that I think you will be very impressed with called pollen.com. That's not hard to remember pollen.com and they have a national allergy map and you can look at the forecast of through the year like when does ragweed pollen come and what I did was I looked at what on earth is going on now and elm pollen the tree I was standing under uh, is is very, is up at a fairly decent level right now and that's causing some people to have some problems and I'm one of those uh, but of course ragweed is famous for being an allergen and there are many others but if you poke around on that website I think if you struggle with allergies I think you'll find it very very interesting uh, because those of us who garden and get outside and, and play with plants uh, sometimes have a little uh, closer encounter with things uh, that can be allergens. And uh, so uh, I uh, have, have noticed uh, that sometimes plants get blamed for being an, an allergy-causing ca plant, and they're not often not. Uh, the, the plants that cause us the, the uh, most problems are the allergens that are pollen floating through the air, wind-blown pollen. So some of our trees, like oaks and pecans, put out a wind-blown pollen. Uh, typically not a big allergy to pecans out there. In fact, I don't even know if there's any. But uh, there are aller allergens like ragweed uh, that are wind-blown. And uh, the uh, junipers, the eastern red cedar, and especially the uh, ash juniper that uh, fills the hill country, uh, when it puts out pollen, people are miserable uh, that, are, that are susceptible in that area. But things like um, goldenrod, for example, is often blamed for pollen allergies. And goldenrod is one of the many plants, as are most of our garden plants, that um, produce a heavier pollen 
that the bees come and land and they carry it around because it sticks to their leg. Uh, goldenrod pollen doesn't float through the air and go across the fence to your neighbors and call them, cause them to start sneezing. Uh, it's, it's a different kind of pollen. And so if you go to this website, uh, pollen.com, uh, uh, I, I think you'll find it interesting. I, the more I read and the more I check things out and the tools that they have and the research that's there and stuff, really, really cool, cool website. Now, I didn't know I was allergic to elm, so now I do. Uh, that, was, that was kind of interesting. Well, uh, we're going to be, um, let's see, I want to talk about some things going on in the community right before we finish up today. Uh, Tuesday, October 13th, today at 7 p.m. this evening at the Station 6 Community Room. That's the Firehouse Station 6 on University Drive, where University and Tarot Street come together. The Brazos Valley Orchid Society meets, and you can bring your blooming orchids or bring your sad, sick orchid and ask them what to do to get it blooming again, and they can help you. Uh, tomorrow, the 14th, A&M Garden Club, 9.30 at the morning, Peace Lutheran Church on Rio Grande uh, in South, South College Station, or what I what used to be South College Station. Now it's not so south anymore. Uh, and there will be a presentation on the Never Forget Garden at the Brazos Valley Memorial. Uh, the meeting of the Texas A&M Garden Interest Group is next Tuesday, the 18th, at 10 a.m. Uh, and that group is going to be actually uh, going on a tour that day out at Millican Reserve, a tour of the farm out at Millican Reserve. Uh, and uh, so if you're interested in uh, learning more about Millican Reserve or uh, learning more about that organization, uh, I would recommend that you consider uh, going to that. Uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, the which is today, the 13th through Saturday, down in Houston, the Garden Club of Houston's Bulb and Plant Mart is going on from 9 to 5 at Church of St. John the Divine on River Oaks. Now, I know that's a long way away, but that is a very interesting uh, bulb sale uh, that they have out there. Lots of different things that you can find uh, and that you can see, and I think you will enjoy it very, very much. Uh, on October 25th, the Brazos County Master Gardeners, 7 p.m., Selecting, Planting, and Caring for Trees in Our Urban Texas Gardens by Gretchen Riley, uh, who is with the Forest Service. Uh, so that's the Master Gardeners at the AgriLife Extension Office, 7 p.m., Tuesday the 25th. Hope you can make it. Well, thanks for listening. Tell your friends. We've got a radio show in town. If they'd like to listen in and be able to ask their questions live, we would look forward to hearing from them, too. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.